and a Missouri Synod congregation. Well, I, I, will, I will state what I think is similar uh, first. Both churches come out of the heritage and the foundation uh, of Martin Luther, who was that uh, monk in, uh, about 500 years ago, uh, that through his reading of scripture, really felt that what was missing, one of the things missing in uh, church life and uh, people's faith life was the uh, importance of grace and that grace, God's grace forgives us and leads us back to God and allows us to live a free life. He felt that was very much missing in, in the context of the church in his time. And so the, the Lutheran heritage is, is, is based on that and a variety of other things as well. The Missouri Synod um, it, it, it will tend to um, focus on the Augsburg Confession, uh, which comes out of, again, Luther's heritage and he and his um, cohort's time. Uh, they, they stick strictly uh, to that, whereas the ELCA tends to um, be a little bit less strict uh, on following the, the letter of the Augsburg Confession, for example. And, and one way of living that out is um, the Missouri Synod would um, tend not to pray with other fellow Christians. Um, that can vary from church to church, though, even within their context. Uh, the Missouri Synod also might not welcome anyone who comes to the uh, church on a particular Sunday up to the table for Holy Communion. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that, but some, uh, one might be because you're not a, a, a written down member of that particular congregation, even if you're a member of a Missouri Synod congregation elsewhere. Um, but part of those things come out of um, man-made tradition, um, and some go through the interpretation of how they are reading scripture. And so those are some of the differences. And that could be a whole year-long study, so I'm just going to uh, kind of cover a rough surface uh, there. Thank you for the question. Uh, one of the questions that came um, early on was from George, and I have it written down here, and it was kind of a a, a thank you softball sort of question. Um, not easy, but um, it was, uh, the question to me was, what are, so I've been here about a year now, what's one or two things that makes me wonder, makes me wonder why does grace do what it does or what are some of the things that this congregation does? And overall, I would say that uh, like, any congregation, things are done differently and done that way for, for different reasons. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. People come up for Holy Communion, and when we kneel at the rail, I was a bit perplexed by people, why people just didn't come up and kneel. And I thought, I, it, it wasn't part of my experience or tradition to every time a table came up to, yes, go ahead and kneel. Well, a couple weeks ago, we had to sit down and, and talked amongst uh, people who lead worship, and they helped me understand that there's a very good reason Grace does that. It's because there's no room to get around if people are kneeling um, behind uh, people on the corners. And it also just makes sense for people to return uh, to their seats. So pastors learn new things all the time too. Uh, I, I find that um, it's wonderful being a part of different congregations and groups and to experience the different things uh, that get done and to see does that, does that still make sense for who we are today? And is there uh, to the ability to ask the question, is that what we should continue to do, or should we try something different? And um, in this case, we'll continue to have people stand until everyone gets around there, and then we'll have people kneel, uh, because it, it truly makes sense. But there might be some other things that we look at and say, well, maybe we'll make a little change or tinker to this. So change will 
as we come into 2017 will continue to be a, a little bit of a, an important catch word uh, as we think about where we're going as a congregation. So that that was that would be my one one uh, answer to that. I don't really have two there, George. Um, the second question George asked was also uh, worship related, and it was about I'm I'm inviting people to be a part of the worship service to to consider being assisting minister or involved in reading. Or, you know, we have the the young people confirmation students, not just uh, being acolytes anymore, we've invited them to take on a greater role. And the question came as to, is there, is there an ultimate goal or reason to have pe more people involved in worship? And I, I think that comes out of my learning, my the practice that the more, the, the liturgy, if you will, is known as the work of the people. So all we do in worship together is meant to be something we do together. Now maybe the tradition here has been that the pastor stands up here and does something to you or at you, but that's not the purpose or the reason that we gather. Our, our purpose is to come together to praise and worship God and to work together to do that. And so my intention, my goal, is to have more people be involved in that so we can develop the, the rich sense of what liturgy is really about and um, hear more voices and more experiences and, and really let that praise uh, of God together really come out. So again, thank you for the question. Other? Ladies first. <laughs> Carol. share that question out here and I'm going to actually leave that for people to contemplate and I'll give a little bit of an answer myself. Um, the question Carol raised was that now in many churches you see the altar more as a, as a centerpiece rather than um, up against a wall. And uh, why, why hasn't Grace considered that um, or has done that? Is it, is it a question of money? Is it a question of theology? And I kind of want to, I'll toss that back at all of you. Maybe that's not um, anything you've heard about or, or thought about or discussed before. Um, and uh, going way back uh, in the, you know, initiation of the church, the altar was always, it, it was perhaps um, in, in Jewish tradition set out a little bit and um, you could get behind it. Um, I'm not sure if it was for spatial reasons um, that the Catholic uh, Church, as it developed, began putting it um, more on the walls, or if that was uh, totally a Protestant uh, creation. Um, but I know one of the things that uh, it was about space for Protestants was that oftentimes they would build churches in, um, or take them over from the, the Catholic churches where the graveyard was behind where the, the, the head of the church was, where the, alt, the altar and the, the cross was. And there was a sense of building and extending that communion rail so that the congregation could worship uh, with the people of all time and place and celebrate the, the life of God in that way. Um, we've certainly gotten away from that tradition um, or understanding even about Holy Communion or being the church. Um, and the, the altar has, has remained against the wall uh, in, in most Protestant, many Protestant churches. And um, often people don't see what goes on up there and there's this sense of mystery and holy of holies. Um, and I think as, as uh, the, the church modernized and became uh, it, the, the reading of scripture changed again, or the understanding of about the meal changed again, and the altar was brought down to and among the people. So 
what happened around it could really feel like a community celebration, a table, a joining of family, not just in all times and places with the graveyard outside, but a richness of what happened inside. So to really answer your question, I don't know that I can do it as to why it hasn't happened here, but that's some background around the overall idea. I can give you a little update on why it was there, because it was in the old church that way. <clears throat> and there was discussion at the time when this church was being built that um, they should have put it out on a table, but it was too late because all the stone and everything had been laid. So that is all I can remember. My mother was on the committee, so I do know a little bit about why it was put on the wall. And for other reasons, I have no idea. And I have no idea why it can't be changed if they want to. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's certainly not a, a criticism. It's one of the things that is very common in churches, right? We, we did it that way because that's the way we've always done it. That's, that happens uh, certainly frequently. And um, it, it's, it's times like this when we are able to ask questions and we feel that we're able to um, ask those things amongst each other that we can look at scripture and look at our hearts and look at what's important for the community today and then answer those questions in a way that helps us live out our faith. So I, I appreciate the question. I uh, appreciate, Margaret, your, your contribution and uh, thought about that. Thank you. John, you had a oh, hand on the too. Uh, I took this a completely <coughs> different way. What was the most difficult dance for Ken to learn? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should let him answer that. <laughs> or see if he even wants to. I'll let you both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to, to put it in sort of a theological, Ken and I take ballroom dance uh, lessons. And, um, so we put it in a theological way. I think one of the um, things that I learned, and, and then we can figure out what, what Ken's learned, but the, the, the sense of lead and follow was extremely helpful to me. Um, and Ken might say I don't follow that well. But <laughs> um, in terms of my understanding of how I put up resistance to God, that I want to be in control. Wait a minute. You want to take me here? I don't want to go that way. You want me to do this? Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I want to do it my way or what I think the move should be with the melody that's happening. And um, it, it's hard. It's, it's hard to see that control. Um, I think I'm a little better at it and, uh, with, with Ken, hopefully with my relationship with God, but Probably more with dancing, <laughs> and I don't think Ken would say that's very good, but, uh, is, and, uh, if, to answer your question directly, it's always anything that you have to travel, false, fox trot, because it's not so much when there's not people on the dance floor, but when there's other people on the dance floor, and then you have to manage traffic, yeah. as you start running into people. <laughs> and if, if people didn't hear that, it's, it's where the, the dance floor is full and the ballroom dances are tr typically traveling dances. And, and again, I connect that with faith. Isn't that always the question, too, for running through life? That when we run into traffic or meet other people, that's where the tests really come, right? Of how can we be flexible enough and how can we stay in God's lead and it, Dance is hard. Faith is uh, uh, even almost harder. So, cool question. Thanks. Other other thoughts? There was uh, a, a question that had come about the Advent wreaths, and um, this is a, a question much like Carol's and the altar on the wall. The Advent candles are blue. And uh, the question was, why are they blue and not the traditional purple and pink, as you might see up here along the, the choir loft uh, balcony? And um, th there was a tradition that the candles 
uh, had been the color of the of purple, and one pink one to stand out for, it, it's also known as Joy Sunday or Rejoicing Sunday in the Advent context. Um, they, the, the liturgics of, of the church, and I, I, it's beyond the, just the Lutheran church, changed from the purple to the blue to bring a, a different sense of the, the, the season of Advent versus Lent. Lent is, is the purple, the, the color of um, sometimes kingliness, but royalty, but also mourning. Um, and I think that it was to differentiate the, the, the two seasons more clearly. And so blue became the predominant color at Advent. It is a color symbolizing hope, which is what this season is to be about. So they, that's one of the reasons they moved uh, that. And, and Grace here began that tradition. And, and maybe, maybe that was brought out when it initially happened and, and that got tucked back uh, in all of our minds. And, and we certainly didn't talk much about that. Uh, this past season. So that's a great question. Reminders. So we, we all need those uh, educational reminders. One last question. Well, I hope that um, in this new year that you're really able to take uh, one, the idea of questions as important for your faith journey, whether it be asking that here or in your um, everyday life and, and the people you encounter. Um, I have a mentor that, that says one of the things that would help our world today is if we all were to um, ask better questions and be open to answers. And uh, I think, I hope that I am as we journey together here um, in, in the uh, learnings I did around the, the Holy Communion and other areas as well about Grace's practices and hopes. But I, but I hope that we as people of God, uh, knowing that we deserve love and respect, can both feel that we can ask and uh, listen to questions without feeling our lives are challenged or diminished by other people's questions. I hope that it makes us stronger I hope that it makes us think, and I hope that it um, will continue to, to grow our faith and hope in each other and the world. I thank you, and um, God bless each and every one of you for this year and our life together. Amen.